now. Airy Hook still on that Reaper, probably gonna want to switch after he dies here, but he does have the Death Blossom up. Reaper, you know, not quite as good in Phase 2 here. They're gonna set Fact Fiction in with the Nano Boost as uh, Phase tries to defend. Airy Hook coming in, that's a good Death oh Blossom. My. Gets three, looking for four. Oh. Mickey gets a kill as well as Forsaken taken down. Switched over to that Zenyatta, but yeah, I guess, you know, normally you want to switch off the Reaper, but if you have the hull, you might as well save it. Harry Hook making it work, and he's like, well, I would swap, but I just can't seem to die. Reaper is the most underrated edgelord in all of Overwatch right now, and like so many other DPS heroes, it's difficult for players and even pros to find a place to shoot through all of the healing and tanking so prevalent in the current meta, but... Despite popular belief, Team Envious, who are debatably the best team in the world right now, put Harry Hook on Reaper to great effect. But to be honest, they're so strong in this meta that it seems like they are able to pick whatever they want and still win. Flexing the single healer, double hit scan, they have a Symmetra pocket pick. They look strong overall and were pretty much uncontested throughout MLG and then, of course, stomped FaZe in the grand final. How does Harry Hook do it? With legions of Overwatch experts claiming that Reaper is unpickable due to the strength of D.Va, how does he find any use? Well, first of all, I think a major component of the Reaper issue is that too many players try to utilize him by sticking him directly into the death ball like any other hero. Yes, of course, if you put him in Soldier's position, trying to spam into a Rhine Shield inside the death ball, you give away Reaper's main edge. <laughs> get it, Edgelord? Ah... Uh... And that is his quick burst damage, which is best facilitated by lurking and pouncing. Not standing out in the open, just spamming into a Rhine Shield as general purpose damage, but instead to be a tactical assassin hero who lurks specific targets, takes and wins duels quickly to snowball a team fight. If Widow plays for picks at long range, Reaper plays for picks at close range. Hiding around corners, taking cheeky positions, and jumping into something's face before they have the chance to react. And Harry Hook plays this exact way well. But there's also another component of Reaper, which is I think somewhat of a bit of an unknown skill component to the character. Now he's not the hardest hero in the game or anything, but there definitely is some mastery to being able to line up a money shot on an enemy player's hitbox to do the maximum amount of burst damage with the bullet economy that you have in reserve. You only get eight shots, so you gotta make them count quickly, otherwise the damage you're doing is gonna get healed away. How do you go about this? Well, Reaper's shotguns, just like plenty of other spread weapons in the game, Roadhog, Diva, Tracer, all see maximum effectiveness when you can jam the spread into the entire hitbox of the player you're shooting. This is done by relentlessly barrel stuffing your gun into an uncomfortably close fight with the enemy. Sometimes it might even feel like an overcommitment for Reaper to play this close, but in truth this is the only way you should consider using Reaper because at any other range his damage is negligible. In fact, it's far more valuable for Reaper to hide around doing nothing until he finds the type of duel he wants to be in, then pounce out of the shadows to immediately pounce the duel he's looking for to inflict maximum punishment as quickly as possible. Learning where the spread of his weapon is is very important. From at a medium distance, you really should only be shooting large tanks and trying to get all the spread into their entire body. But as you close the distance, you'll deal maximum punishment by stuffing the entire shotgun spread into that money shot. And by doing so, you can actually one-shot a squishy. Now, this is a difficult shot to get, but that's the beauty of it. Reaper takes a lot more skill than you think. Because, obviously, heroes that you're trying to close the distance onto see you playing Reaper and try to get the heck out of there. Shotguns are terrifying at close range, so the enemy player is going to be ducking and dodging quickly in front of you, making it likely that you're going to whiff entirely. But, if you're able to land that crucial shot, bursting into the enemy's head, no hero scares you. Not even the 600 HP Roadhog, who gets melted like the rest of them. Harry Hook has nano boost on him, he doesn't even have to barrel stuff the McCree lying on the floor to get a one-shot kill. But what's important to note is that he's able to do this damage through Transcendence. And with the good fundamental play, Harry Hook's nano-boosted Hellfire shotguns deleted him quickly. There's not much DPS in the game that is going to be able to do that through the powerful Transcendence healing. And the quickness of that kill and the ones to follow is what makes Reaper devastating when played correctly. Now, it can be argued that you can see comparable output from other DPS characters. Sure, that may be the case. But I think this yields evidence of the fact that if a player has command of a certain hero, if you set up that hero properly, just about no matter what meta you're in, you can create the situations for it to have success. And that's an impressive part of Harry Hook's Reaper, playing in a meta where no other team finds it even feasible. The map that I felt that Reaper was strongest for Envious 
was Ilios and particularly Lighthouse. Because there's so many close range engagements, corners to hide around, buildings to be hidden inside, cheeky high ground for Harry Hook to hide in, Harry was a force to be reckoned with on this map whenever they pulled him out. Here Reaper's not showing himself and hiding at the top. Fnatic drops Soundberry, which saves the McCree's life, and the Diva comes to aid. Granted, Enigus is going to end up losing this team fight at the end of it, but it's not like Harry Hook didn't do his job with flying colors here. He kept Buds on McCree on the back foot for the entirety of it, winning a duel that McCree is supposed to win. Because, as Reaper, if you pounce your enemy first and put them on the back foot, it's incredibly difficult for them to respond because you're going to be up so far in the damage battle. Remember, Reaper has a fancy little edge that you shouldn't forget in his DPS duels, having 250 HP. McCree's stun and flashbang combo only does 150, enough to kill a tracer. But, if Reaper shoots you in the head first, it's almost physically impossible for McCree to stun and shoot his way out of that position. Now granted, on paper, McCree's supposed to be really good against Reaper, because his ranged damage should be able to deny him from getting close, and he should be able to see him coming close and stun him beforehand. But if McCree has to fight into you, or you effectively flank him on your own terms, creating that close range engagement allowing you to strike first, it's difficult for McCree or frankly any squishy to respond in time to do enough damage to kill the Reaper. Buds fails so miserably on McCree, and Harry Hook does such a good job of avoiding the D.Va and hiding in random spots, that Bud swaps off the McCree to a Tracer who can just avoid the Reaper's burst damage. And let me reiterate, Fnatic's one of the most fundamentally sound teams in the game. It just so happens that Envious is even better in that regard. They've got the skilled positions and the strong team play. So even though that Fnatic seemed to know the answer to the Reaper, they're not able to execute it as well because of the positional plays and timing and patience by Harry Hook, knowing when to properly engage and able to hit the chunky shots when he goes for it. What is Harry Hook looking for in these engages? Each team fight, he's fishing for an opportunity to find their biggest threat. Target prioritization could take an entirely separate video for us to cover, but note this meta in particular, and I know it's about to change, so this may change as well, is about focusing the DPS threats. We're a couple metas removed from where healers were the top priority, because right now, healers have such great sustain, and with Ana's defensive capabilities, it simply isn't worth it to put the resources in to try to trade your life for an Ana, if that means it's going to keep a DPS alive. So with that being the case, he hones in on the McCree, or the Roadhog, or whoever the enemy team's threat is, because that will develop the mid-fight, I'm borrowing and adapting this term a bit from Counter-Strike, but a mid-fight to me in Overwatch, is after the break of the fight, when damage is beyond just poking and the fight is committed and trades start happening. You have to make a crucial decision on what resources you're going to put where, who's worth to focus fire first, and what the effects of that's going to be, what your win condition is. If you're playing the Reaper, removing their DPS means that throughout the mid-fight after that, if you survive and they don't, in that exchange, it's pretty likely that Reaper will snowball through the mid-fight because this burst of damage is just so good. As long as that one counter, be it the Roadhog hook or the McCree range hit scan damage, is removed from the fight immediately, he can feel safe in snowballing the fight from there. This is important to note because back when Mercy was played, I think it got in a lot of players' heads that you have to focus healers first. And the only reason for that was, was because Rez flipped a team fight the other way, so that if you ignored her, you'd play right into her hands. Well, that's not the case anymore, necessarily. If you could pick off an Ana, great, but typically she's positioned in such a way where she's not in the fight enough for it to be worth the resources for you to focus her. Instead, you focus those star players, remove them from the fight, then snowball your advantage from there. Because if you have DPS and they don't, all the taking in the world doesn't really matter. The multi-tank team comp is held together by propping up a specific star player. Typically the Roadhog, but most of the other tanks are just there to get in the way to absorb damage for that star player. So using an assassin like Reaper can be effective in winning team fights in the meta where nothing dies. Guys, Reaper will always be hanging in the wings as a devastating duelist in the right hands. He's the type of DPS that if you set yourself up properly, and find the duels that you want and win them before it becomes a detriment to your team, Reaper can be viable. Harry Hook shows us that with intelligent play and good mechanical control of Reaper, even in a meta where everyone says he's useless, he can still be used. No speed increase on nano boost required. Now, crucially in this video, we didn't cover his ultimate at all, because to be honest, Envious wasn't setting it up as a crucial component of their team wipes. They weren't running Zarya, so instead they rely on Coco's Earth Shatter and Mickey's Self-Destruct to set up team wipes in that regard. They make a cheeky blade blade here or there, but the biggest success that I saw on Harry Hook's Reaper at MLG was his ability to duel things and get pickoffs in a meta where the assumption is nothing dies, unless it gets Roadhog hooked. 
Oh, and by the way, they have one of the best Roadhog players in the world, so that kind of helps your flexibility along. But that goes without saying. Any hero pick is a lot easier to make if you have really great teammates. But of course, you already know that. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. It really does help us out and lets us know that you're interested in more pro analysis. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. We upload each and every day, so be sure to hit the bell icon so you can get notified whenever our videos go live. We have a Twitch stream as well, linked in the description. Click on that and be sure to set up email notifications so you can see when our streams go live. Follow us on Twitter, at YT for stream announcements, updates, cool clips, and ramblings from me about the game at 140 characters a pop. We have a Discord server as well, where you can find friends to play the game with and to interact with the Overwatch community. Well, that's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. I'll see you guys next time.